Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another session of Indialog Foundation Certificate Course in Dialog Studies. I'm Pushpika and I'm a volunteer at Indialog Foundation and I was also part of this cohort of 2022 batch. So um, today we have the pleasure of having Ms. Patricia Garsha with us. Um, if I talk about her a bit, she's the Partnership Ma Development Manager at the, of the Institute for Economics and Peace, IEP. She's a highly respected humanitarian and human rights advocate with experience in project development, uh, design and delivery, uh, campaigning and fundraising. She's also worked for more than 20 years in some of the world's most dangerous conflicts, including uh, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Sudan, South Sudan, and the Thai, um, Thai Burma border. She was also appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 2016 and was a finalist in the 2016 NSW Australian of the Year Awards for her contribution and services to the international sector, humanitarian aid development sector over the past two decades. Ma'am, she uh, Ma'am is also a human rights research fellow at the University of Sydney Center for Peace and Conflict Studies from 2000 to 2002, and designed the human human rights course for the Master of Peace and Conflict Studies at CPACS. Ms. Garcia is also an honorary associate at the University of Sydney, where she is a sessional lecturer on peace and human rights with a passion for promoting and advancing the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda. And today she will speak on the topic, Contemporary Challenges of Development in the Transitioning Era of Geopolitical Complexities and Conflicts. Ma'am, you have uh, up to two hours for the session and you may leave as much time for the question discussions as you like to. So yeah, over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much and uh, uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning uh, to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bezad, for inviting me to uh, be able to have the opportunity to speak with you um, and uh, looking forward to um, uh, also um, learning uh, more from uh, some of the participants here uh, about their course. Um, I'd like also first just to say that um, I am um, uh, like to acknowledge that I am meeting with you on the land of the Kamargal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting with you, and to also pay my respects to the traditional elders past, present and emerging. As uh, uh, Pushpika mentioned, um, I would like to um, uh, start with my presentation that um, as maybe Bezad might have mentioned, I, and uh, Pushpika mentioned that I was um, uh, honored to be able to present a talk at, at the um, SDG summit uh, at the UN conference um, this year in September at, in New York. And uh, that conference was very much about looking at uh, the, um, the current global challenges we are facing around the world in particular, how we are able to um, uh, address the um, competing challenges that we're meeting, whether it's climate change, um, whether it's uh, um, climate justice, economic inequality, um, uh, issues relating to health, whether it's issues to do with the planet. We have also issues to do with geopolitical conflicts and also a very um, disturbing and uh, I think um, uh, a rising um, societal polarization and growing inequality. And with these global challenges now, uh, there is in many ways what some people have called a sort of polycrisis. And living in an era of a polycrisis and also what many of us are calling a multipolar world, um, how do we deal with the um, the uh, the challenges um, that we are facing in this uh, era of a polycrisis and a multipolar world? With the SDGs, as many of you may know, um, this was a historic uh, uh, agreement in 2015 when all UN member states, heads of government, came together 
to pledge and formally adopt the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals with 169 targets to transform our world uh, for a better future in which we would have a more peaceful, sustainable and equal future. And since that time, we've now reached what we call the halfway mark, the midpoint, seven years later, where we have found out that um, all countries that have pledged and, and committed to adopt the SDGs have shown that they have actually not been able to meet the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. In fact, many of the countries um, in many ways have actually um, uh, deteriorated in their in their um, meeting of their targets, um, with many of them backsliding, going down. And this has really put a sense of um, alarm and urgency to the world, particularly when we see what's going on in the issue of climate change, the environmental, um, uh, ecological threats that we are facing today, from everything from water stress to population growth to food security, uh, natural disasters, sea level rise, and also um, rising temperatures. And with all of these um, um, uh, situations affecting our planet and also our people, um, we need to find what the UN uh, chief uh, is saying is a rescue plan to rescue our people and rescue our planet. This was the sort of urgent message that was given in the midway, halfway point of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. In other words, we now only have another seven years, which was part of the original 15 years by 2030 to achieve these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The situation is that if we only now have seven years, which for a lot of people is, is less than, uh, in, in uh, if you look at it in terms of um, days, um, we're looking at less than 4,000 days. That's not a lot of time to be able to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And many of you know what they are. And the goal that I want to focus on tonight is because of time, is to focus on the goal of peace, particularly the goal of peace, and also as a cross-checking, cross a cross-cutting goal, we know that the goal of peace is also connected to the other goals, particularly the goal of poverty, the goal of education, the goal of gender equality, the goal of uh, economic growth and uh, good work, decent work, the goal of inequality, reducing inequalities, and the goal of partnership. So it's the cross, if you like, cross-cutting goal that not only affects um, peace and the goal of peace, strong institutions and justice, but also it relates to these other seven, seven goals and all their indicators. So what I'd like to ask if possible is at, at the SDGs, um, we had a youth delegate who, who was speaking saying that as a representative from the youth, we would like to see that people stop talking and take action. With all these challenges now, the youth are speaking and they are saying, we want to be involved in the actions. We don't want to keep hearing talk. And this was a very strong message coming from the youth. And I'd like to say that this is one thing that I'd like to call on all of you here to think about what sorts of actions you can take in terms of looking at what you could address in terms of dealing with how we can achieve peace in the world and particularly um, the goal of uh, peace, justice and strong institutions. And I'd like to offer one way in which we could take some action and that is by understanding the concept of what IEP calls positive peace. So now I'd like to just share some uh, um, slides to explain what do we mean by positive peace.
we're mostly a research institute. And with our research, you could see here that our research um, has been uh, used by many organizations, including the OECD, Commonwealth Secretariat, the World Bank and the United Nations. Most of our reports are included in thousands of university courses, and we have trained over 4,500 IEP ambassadors. And you could see here the number of downloads of our reports in the last 12 months. The aim of um, IEP is we would like to shift people's mindset to think of peace as a positive, tangible, and achievable measure of human well-being and development. Most of you know that the word peace is used commonly by everybody, and it means many different things to different people. We use the word peace, as you know, as a greeting. We use the word salam, shalom, shanti, um, and then in uh, Farsi, sukh. There are over 350 words that are used to mean peace in many languages. But tonight, I just like to talk about the concept of peace um, as IEP defines it. And we would like to start by saying that we see peace as not just what many people think is absence of violence, absence of war, but we see peace as not only this concept, but also that you have to look at the positive factors that make a peaceful country or a peaceful community peaceful. So what we did first, back in 2008, when IEP was founded, we were the first organization to measure peace. And this was in our first report, which is called the Global Peace Index. Many of you might have heard of this. This is an annual report, which, uh, which is produced every year, that looks at measuring the absence of violence or the fear of violence in 163 countries. This represents 99.7% of the population. I'll just go through the 2023 Global Peace Index. Now, the Global Peace Index looks at um, three major domains. The first domain is domestic and international conflict. And some of the measures we use to, in, to, to look at um, domestic and international conflict includes things like relations with neighboring countries, the number of deaths in a conflict, and the amount of organized inter, inter, internal conflicts in a country. The other dimension is called safety and security. Now, the key measures we use to, um, to uh, rank uh, and define safety and security in a country include the number of refugees and IDPs, in a country, the impact of terrorism in a country, the homicide rate, incarceration rate. After the um, second uh, dimension, we have one more dimension called militarization. And that the dimension includes looking at measures or indicators such as the amount of military expenditure of each country, the number of, um, of uh, personnel, armed personnel, um, the number of purchase of weapons that are used um, by a country, the number of battle deaths, for example, in a country. So in, um, in the Global Peace Index, these are the three, if you like, uh, themes or dimensions that we um, that we cover to look at each country's uh, ranking or score of peacefulness. This is a world map of the 2023 Global Peace Index to show you by color um, which are the most peaceful countries and the least peaceful countries. As you can see here with the color, the green, a dark green, is the other countries that are the most peaceful. And then as it goes to green, light green, and then it goes to yellow, then orange, then red, with red being the least peaceful countries. 
as you can see from this map, maybe you could see where uh, India, you can see there it's yellow. So yellow would consider to be pretty much an average um, uh, in terms of out of 163 countries. Can anyone tell me, uh, if possible, um, where they think India is on the Global Peace Index? Here we are. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. Now, we can see here that Iceland remains the most peaceful country in the world. With Libya and Burundi having the most improvement in the P Global Peace Index in terms of increased peacefulness, the Middle East and North Africa region also improved, and Europe remains the most peaceful region. Now, before I go on to the next slide, I want to ask uh, people can put on the chat which country they think is the least peaceful in the Global Peace Index. Okay, we have here Afghanistan, remains the world's least peaceful nation. And it is also recorded, though, in the last year, the largest increase in peacefulness. And that could have been because of the um, uh, increased security as a result of the Taliban government having uh, uh, come into power in 2021. So it, although the Taliban have uh, enabled the country to have more security, but they still are the, the least peaceful country in the world, 163 out of 163. Conflict deaths have increased by 96%. Russia and Eurasia recorded the steepest regional deterioration, and six of the nine Global Peace Index regions recorded deterioration. These are the top 10 countries that are the most peaceful out of 163 countries. I think for many of you, many of you would not be surprised. Though interesting to see, we have two countries in, from Asia who are now included in the top 10, and that's Singapore and Japan. These are the next 10 least peaceful countries. So the the um, trend over the last 13 years has shown that 97 countries have deteriorated while 66 have improved. And the overall peacefulness um, year by year over the, trend, over the last 13 years shows that peace has actually deteriorated. This is a global picture. Now, what were the main indicators that contributed to the deterioration? And the key indicators were violent demonstrations, as, see, as you can see here in the, in the red, red um, uh, graph. And also second would have been external conflicts and internal conflicts. At the same time, the indicators that showed improvements in most of the countries was increase in UN peacekeeping funding. And there was also probably uh, less, uh, less um, supply of nuclear and heavy weapons and also less armed services personnel. This is just in the last year. We found that the biggest, the countries which had the highest battle deaths were in Ethiopia and Ukraine. And I think for many of you, you were probably not surprised with that because these two countries had extreme conflict in the last year. The other trend over this last 15 years shows, shows us that 
there has been more countries involved in external conflicts than at any other time. And also the level of internal com conflicts has also risen over the past 15 years. So these are very worrying trends about why the peace has deteriorated around the world over the last 15 years. This is a very important slide. As you know, the Institute for Economics and Peace also measures and analyzes peace, and also we measure the economic cost of violence. In 2022, which is the data that is produced for the 2023 Global in Peace Index, $17.5 trillion was the cost of the violence that was um, that occurred in 2022 around the world. In other words, governments are spending 17.5 trillion on violence around the world. And this is really a shocking figure because what it represents, that's equivalent to 12.9% of the total world GDP or $2,200 per person. What we really would like to show with this figure is that what could we do if we just took 10% uh, of that 17.5 trillion, 1.75 trillion, just think what we could do instead of spending that 1.75 trillion on violence, what we could do if governments and communities could spend that money on improving the health, reducing the poverty, providing education, and assisting with development projects of the country. We'd like to see now how people can look at why so much money is being spent on violence. And the majority of that violence is military expenditure of each country. In other words, governments are spending most of that money on military expenditure. Just move that on. I come now to the concept of positive peace. As I mentioned earlier, this last, um, these slides I was showing you about Global Peace Index, IEP refers to this peace, which is the actual peace, peacefulness of countries, which we, we were uh, showing you in the 163 countries. IEP calls this peace negative peace because it's measuring absence of violence or the fear of violence, which we call looking at the broken bits the dysfunctional bits in a society. What we found out is that this was not in sufficient. To understand peace, you don't look at just the broken bits or the dysfunctional bits in a society. You have to also look at what are the positive factors in a society that make the, the society peaceful. This is why we call positive peace are the characteristics in a peaceful country that make a country peaceful. And we sometimes use the, if you like, the example of the human body. As many of you know, medicine and discoveries um, uh, by doctors um, have shown that they have been able to find ways in which to help the human body by focusing on diseases and illnesses. And that's great. But we also learn that we also have to know how does the body stay healthy? And we also learn that by looking at things like regular exercise, a good diet, these factors keep a body healthy. This is what we call positive, if you like, positive peace. And looking at diseases and illnesses is called negative peace. So we use the human body as an example to show you that with peace, you have this concept of negative peace, which looks at absence of violence or fear of violence. And then we have positive peace. And IEP defines positive peace as providing the optimal environment for human potential to flourish. 
And positive peace represents attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. Whereas negative peace, which we learned in the Global Peace Index, is more about the absence of violence or the fear of violence. Okay, I'm just showing you the slide on positive peace. And I mentioned to you that the positive peace are the, uh, if we like to say, the, the attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies, which are the positive factors that make a community or a country peaceful. And these uh, factors are called, uh, they are actually called eight pillars. They are a set of eight pillars um, or factors. And these uh, pillars or factors are interrelated. As you can see from the slide, they are all connected. In other words, you can't just deal with one pillar. You have to deal with all pillars if you want to create peace. Now, if I just explain what each of the pillars are, because this is very important to understand the eight pillars of positive peace is what IEP calls the positive peace that we are trying to show how we can create peaceful societies and peaceful communities that become you know, resilient, cohesive, inclusive. And these three eight pillars are well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, good relations with neighbors, high levels of human capital, acceptance of the rights of others, low levels of corruption, and sound business environment. As you can see, all of these eight pillars, they all in many ways have a connection with each other. And these are, if you like, what we call all the social, cultural, economic, political factors that drive peace. If you can see this slide here, the eight pillars of positive peace create the optimum environment for humans' potential to flourish. In other words, by, by applying all these eight pillars, we are able to contribute to creating peace within your community or within, within your country. And why, why is this important? Why, why positive peace? IEP has been able to show that through its research, because this research has been undertaken for more than a decade, that there are some benefits by applying all these eight pillars within a, within a community or a country. They contribute to increasing peace and contributing to positive peace because what happens is that when you have more positive peace, you're also going to generate increased per capita income, stronger resilience, you will have better environmental outcomes and high measures of well being, such as um, better health, better education. And then you will also have better sustainable development goals outcomes. So these are some of the benefits of being able to show if you can, if you can uh, increase positive peace in your community, you will also have these benefits that will, uh, that will result from an increased positive peace. Just move these scores. Just move on because I'm just checking the time. Now in IEP's positive peace report, we have been able to show that we have um, in our ranking of 163 countries to measure the positive peace of 163 countries. In our positive peace report, the top 10 countries in the 2022 positive peace report are, as you can see here.
Now, the 10 least peaceful countries in the positive peace report, in terms of positive peace, are also here. As you can see on your left, these are the key if you like, um, pillars, which I mentioned before, the positive peace pillars. And you could see which were the most important pillars that affected the peacefulness of the countries around the world. And the one that had the most effect, positive effect, improved the peacefulness of the countries was the pillar free flow of information. Um, we also had the good relations with neighbors, and the equitable distribution of resources as the top three, if you like, uh, pillars that had the uh, most important um, uh, effect of increasing the peacefulness of the countries around the world. Now, the red graph at the bottom shows you the pillar which had the most um, influence in decreasing the peacefulness. In other words, countries, it, it created a deterioration in the peacefulness of the country. And this was the pillar low level of corruption. And I can let you know that with the case of India, with the country of India, um, the pillars that they did very well in was actually um, the pillar of, um, uh, just looking here, um, The pillar of um, acceptance of the rights of others and also um, the high level of uh, human capital. Whereas the corruption pillar was the one that created a deterioration in the ranking of India. In other words, um, India, again, and the Positive Peace Index is ranked um, 87 um, out of 163 countries, compared to 126 out of 163 countries with the Global Peace Index. And the reason for that is that um, India has done pretty well, but really has shown a deterioration in positive peace. Um, whereas in the global peace index, in the negative peace, it ranks sort of average compared to the rest of the world. And in the in the South Asia region, um, India ranks fifth out of the seven South Asian countries on the global peace index. So what we want to say here is that um, the issue of corruption actually created a deterioration in the peacefulness of India, um, whereas the, um, uh, the pillar, um, uh, which we call free flow of information and acceptance of the rights of others, were the two, um, uh, uh, if you like, pillars that, had an, uh, that created an improvement in India's um, ranking of peacefulness. This is the graph to show you how attitudes, institutions, and structures have affected the peacefulness of uh, the countries around the world. And the red color, uh, the red uh, line is the attitudes, the light blue institutions, and the dark blue is the structures. And as you can see here, um, when, uh, when the figure goes uh, down, uh, the graph, the line goes down, sorry, it means that the countries is become more peaceful. Whereas um, the, red, uh, the red line, for example, shows you when it goes up, it shows you that the countries have become least peaceful. In other words, the attitudes um, domain has shown a deterioration, whereas the structures which is the one, the dark blue at the bottom, it shows that it has actually shown improvement. So the structures has been improved, but the attitudes have deteriorated over time in this last decade. To show you which of the, which of the um, if you like, the domains in peacefulness um, have contributed to peace and which ones have 
cause a deterioration in peace. Again, looking at the which were the most important indicators affecting again the improvement um, or the deterioration of peace in the countries overall. You could see here that um, individuals using the internet, um, inequality, life expectancy um, are the top two, if you like, indicators of a country to show what has shown improvement in peacefulness. In other words, access to internet was one of the common, if you like, uh, indicators that affected the in peacefulness of countries. Whereas the deterioration, which is a really important one now, is quality of information, which is right down the bottom in the red. And really that points to things like, for example, the increase in disinformation, misinformation, particularly in the digital sort of um, space, where, as many of you know, there has been increase in things like uh, in the social media with disinformation, misinformation, and um, hate speech, and so forth. And this is why the quality of information um, had significantly affected um, uh, many countries um, and also contributed to deterioration in their peace. Now, when we talk about peace um, and the way IP talks about peace, as we mentioned, this idea of negative peace and positive peace, we actually talk about peace as a system. So when we talk about system, there is no general definition of a system, but there are some uh, characteristics that are very um, specific to a system. What is we say about system is that a system is approached by having internal controls or internal factors as well as external factors. And with a system, there is always a boundary. There are always boundaries in a system. In other words, you have a system, then you have inner system, you have a subsystem, and then another subsystem behind a subsystem. In other words, a system is characterized by having boundaries. Also, they operate with a high degree of complexity. In other words, in a system, there are a lot of relationships, interrelationships. There are what you call inputs and feedback loops. And there are sometimes, just like if you look at a system, if you look at our human body as a system, you know, you can see my ears, my face, my, but you cannot see what's inside. You can't see that inside of our bodies, for example, are many organs, but we can't actually see, but we know that they are also have systems between systems inside. In other words, we have nerves, we have molecules, we have atoms, and everything is in a system. They're connected to each other. And if you take out an organ from your body, for example, if you take out your liver, what happens to the liver? The liver will not survive if it's outside of your body because everything inside our body is connected and it cannot survive um, unless it is connected with every other part of the body. And this is why we want to describe peace also is like that, is like a system. So just like what we say here, is a soccer, a soccer team or your school or your family a system? And what we are saying is that all of these are all systems. So just like the peace is a system, all those eight pillars that I mentioned to you are connected and they all interact with each other. So for example, the pillar well-functioning government is very closely related to low levels of corruption, which again can be closely related to free flow of information. And we can do the same with the other pillars. I'm just giving you this as an example, how all of these pillars, just like a system, are based on interrelationships and interrelated factors. Again, you see here how we talk about a system 
where you have the large super system like our ecosystem, then you have the international community, then we have again a subsystem called the nations that form the international community. And then within the nations, you have a parliament, you have police, you have schools, you can have hospitals, you can have um, all football teams. This is the way how we describe systems. And then within a system, there is subsystems, just like you see here in this um, uh, diagram. So just like human beings as a system, all, all human uh, societies have, like in the system, have an intention. They also want to desire to grow and they also seek stability and they also want to improve. All of these factors are what we also find in a system. And these are also what we find in a human society and all the systems that comprise human, uh, human society. So we use biology a lot to explain systems because just like the human body is a system, we also want to describe peace using biology to make people understand that peace is also a system and to think of it using systems thinking. So how do we use this positive peace, eight pillars of peace? I want to show the connection with the SDGs. If you take SDG 16, just as one example, our positive peace framework, the eight pillars of positive peace, provides an alternative measure of progress so that you could actually use the eight pillars of positive peace to, to um, if you like, um, uh, monitor, assess, or, or, or verify how each of the 17 goals are being achieved. Now, you could use positive peace as a, as a lens to critique the 17 SDGs. For example, if you take all the 169 targets in the Sustainable Development Goals, there is only one target out of all the 169 that is actually referring to corruption. And that's the target, the target of corruption is in Goal 16 which is the one we're just talking about, goal 16, which is the goal of peace, justice, and strong institutions. It's a bit odd that you have 17 goals which look at uh, wanting to transform our world with peace, with prosperity, with, with protecting our planet, with having partnership and protecting people. All these Ps, peace, planet, people, prosperity, partnership. And yet only one of the targets to meet these five P's refers to corruption. <clears throat> so we need to focus as to why corruption is so important if we want to address all these five P's and all these 17 SDGs, because corruption is a very key pillar out of the eight, uh, eight pillars that actually affects um, the peacefulness of all the countries. As I mentioned to you before, the, the corruption pillar was the main pillar in India's um, ranking of peacefulness that affected the peacefulness of India. And yet it's only one, one of the 169 targets. So it's important that we actually use this corruption target to try to analyze how you can improve the peacefulness of a country by dealing with this problem of corruption and trying to decrease corruption if you want to make a country more peaceful. Another important, um, if you like, pillar or target in the SDGs is the issue of access to public information and, and uh, what we call having media freedom freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and being able to access public information. 
And this is the same as our pillar, free flow of information, which you saw earlier. It's one of the eight pillars. Again, this is another uh, target which falls in the, in, the, in the goal SDG 16, the goal of peace, justice, and strong institutions. These are some of the organizations that IEP is working with, in which we have been delivering positive peace workshops, where we have conducted um, workshops um, with uh, participants from these organizations to um, show them um, how to apply the positive peace framework. And these are some of the countries where we have actually run and organized positive peace workshops um, to be able to show the communities, organizations, um, how they can actually use the positive peace framework to build peace in their communities. These are the different organizations, institutions that we work with to be able to uh, uh, show them our research as well as our um, uh, online academies and also um, delivering the positive peace workshops that I mentioned to you earlier. As you can see there, we, we have had um, partners with very different organizations from indigenous groups to governments, to religious leaders, to military, to police, diaspora communities, um, as well as NGOs, universities, educational institutions. And last but not least, I'll just show you this last slide to show you what, um, what I do with my team. I'm, I am not a researcher myself, but I work in the partnerships um, unit of the organization where we are the ones that are the bridge from research to practice, where we actually um, apply the research that has been produced in our reports and try to show people how they can use our research, such as the, the, the positive peace framework, the eight pillars of positive peace, to do some, to as a practical tool, to look at the issues that communities, organizations are, are facing and how they can use this eight pillars of positive peace to actually um, increase the peacefulness in their communities or their organizations. And we run different sorts of um, trainings, if you like, and workshops and capacity building. And that includes the, the, uh, not only the Positive Peace workshops, but also we have an online academy called the Positive Peace Academy. And that is a free short online course that introduces the concept of positive peace and the positive peace framework. We also run a free um, online training program called IP Ambassadors Program. And this uh, equips participants with IP, with the knowledge of IP's research, uh, its uh, methodologies, and also uh, tools to be able to show you how you could apply peace and how to help build peace in your communities. We also have the strategic partners, as I mentioned earlier, with different, very big, vast range of organizations and institutions. And all our reports and publications are available for free and they, are, they can be downloaded on IEP's website called visionofhumanity.org. So if you would like any of our reports and all our publications, they are all available on our website visionofhumanity.org and all our reports can be done, downloaded for free. I think I'll stop there because I think if there's any chance now, maybe I could open it up to questions and answers. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation. So here the platform is open, everybody. Please feel free to share your comments, questions. Yes, we have a Naim from Afghanistan. So you're having a question, right? Please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Madam, thank you so much for your topics and enlightenment topics. Uh, it was really great. Uh, but the question is, 
Uh, while we are hearing about peace every day uh, and, and bad conflicts uh, in all around the world, but we are witness of increasing the conflicts. Yesterday it was in Afghanistan, today it's in Ukraine and the, also in Gaza, uh, from uh, between Gaza and Israel. Israel. Um, and we see that the superpowers like America, the um, England and so on, they are just supporting this and instead of um, banding of them, why they are just increasing is uh, read the piece on theory, uh, but it's just increasing. What would be the reason, the big reason? Um, they are um, the theoreticians of this um, peace, um, banding of peace, but it's every day increasing. What is the big reason for this kind of conflicts? Thank you. Well, I think you saw, um, thank you, Naim. It's a, it's a very important question. I think we are all um, finding it's a, we are, we are living in very, very troubled times, especially as we are now facing with the conflicts that you just mentioned around the world. Um, I really don't know how to answer that question other than to say that um, the, we are, we're experiencing a lot of increased militarization around the world. And that militarization, if you saw, is one of the key domains that ranks the peacefulness. In other words, if you look at peace as being uh, absence of violence, absence of fear of violence, then those people who are committing the violence and continue to commit the violence are never going to have the peace because it will always be a situation that they are not achieving peace because the militarization factor continues to increase. They are not contributing to decreasing that. If we decrease militarization, if we decrease internal conflict and external conflict and we, de and we improve safety and security of people, then there would be a chance that we could see some signs of peacefulness going up. But these, if you look at the rankings of these countries, have you noticed that they have stayed all the time? They have never gone up in peacefulness, these current countries, particularly those currently now we are dealing with. They're always in the bottom. In other words, they are not understanding peace because they are doing things that is only contributing to more negative peace, which is more violence, more conflict. So, um, we can't say when you say we, why we can do it because the countries you're talking about, there has not been any improvement at all because they continue to, to show militarization, to show continuing armed conflict, to show continuing lack of safety and security. And that's why we can measure it. We can show people why these countries are not able to be peace because we are showing you what are the factors that is creating that. So if you want to find peace, you have to find ways to deal with the militarization, to deal with the, with reducing the, um, the arms to a uh, conflict, to reducing, uh, to increase the safety and security. And people won't know how to deal with the, uh, uh, stopping the conflict when they don't know what is the cause or that it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue. But we are trying to unpack this complex, what we call the complexity by giving you something that can be measured. And because no one used to measure peace before, no one knew how to measure peace. Now we are showing that you can measure peace. So if we want to do something with Afghanistan, we can look at why Afghanistan is the least peaceful country. Look at all the reasons why, as I showed you in the indicators. And then you have to look at each one and say, why are we having this issue? Why are we having that issue? How can we address this issue? Just like I showed you with India, corruption is a big issue in India that contributes to it deteriorating. So this is what we mean about analysis of a problem. I hope that makes sense because before, when you talk about how do you address, address P, uh, the conflict, it's very hard to ask someone, how do you deal with the cause? There are many reasons why a conflict happens. 
Uh, thank you, you, you madam. As you were in Afghanistan, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were in Afghanistan are, also, we are, and we, we are, know we the indicators and the wars. All the militaries were in Afghanistan for many years, maybe it's for more than 20 years. But there isn't any changes in Afghanistan. All these indicators don't work, or is there any problem with these indicators, or there is any other problem? It's not the indicators. It is what people do with the indicators. It's not the indicators. It's not a problem of the indicators. You have to. These indicators is giving you the signal, the measure you have to think of, and then you work out how to deal with it. In other words, did you have you heard of corruption being a problem in Afghanistan? Now you know it is. Did did yes. you know before? Did you know what to do about it before? No one knows, but of mm -hmm. course they know. They know it exists. So now your your job is to think of what is the problem with the corruption? Where is it? What where is happening that makes the country corrupt? You have to look at many things, right? Mm -hmm. So this we are pointing you to the indicators. So you start with the one issue. The other issue is a well a well functioning government. Is a well functioning government in, in Afghanistan? Is it a well functioning government? No. No, and why not? So you can you can see all the indicators we saw there. Mm -hmm. Did you see the 24 indicators that were all listed on the bottom? Mm -hmm. Internal conflict, uh, high mortality rate, um, high, um, uh, high murder rate, terrorism, high terrorism. These were all the indicators. So when you think of a well-functioning government, if they're doing spending so much on violence, if they're spending money on arms, if they're spending time killing people, if they're having police, these are all the things you have to look at that create a, a government to becoming not, not well-functioning. So if you want to make it functioning well, you have to deal with these problems, how to stop it, right? So this is what, but before no one knew what to do when you had a problem in the country. They just saw many problems, but how do you deal with all of this? But we are showing you now, there is diff, there are common things in every country that create the possibility to create peace. If the country has good relations with neighbors, would it have peace? If a country has good, good free of, if, if everyone has access to information, would that contribute to peace? If you have a good sound business environment, does this contribute to peace? All of these factors all contribute. We have, we can show it through our research. These all contribute to peace. So we are not wanting you to focus on the conflict, Naim. We, we are trying to say that this is only one small it's like I told you, like the human body is doctors looking only at the disease in your body. But you also have to look at what makes you healthy. Right. So mm -hmm. this is what we mean by positive peace. The eight pillars is like looking at the things that make the country good, peaceful. And that's what we need to look at. Unfortunately, the leaders do not think like this. That's why we have the problem. <laughs> Thank you. So, Naeem, I hope you can start thinking like this. Then you can show your leaders in Afghanistan how they want to create peace, okay? <laughs> we wish so. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Naeem. Um, who would like to go next? I mean, it's a great, great talk. And I also have a lot of the things to say. But yeah, I want others to please start with. And uh, ma'am, if I'm not wrong, then what I am getting is that these eight pillars are basically our, a roadmap which we have got now, through which now we can have at least some directions to move ahead in the issues yeah. and towards the solution. Exactly, exactly. If you look at those eight pillars, you can apply it in any culture, any country, because they have no, what do you call it? They're not, uh, what do you call it, um, dependent on culture, nothing. If you look at these eight pillars, again, well-functioning government, free flow of information, equitable distribution of resources, good relations with neighbors, acceptance of the rights of others. And we have a high level of human capital, which means like, a high level of education and training, especially of the youth. Uh, 
And then um, low low level of corruption, in other words, you know, uh, and uh, no, no very low level of corruption, and also good sound business environment. All of these eight contributes to making the country peaceful, positive, peaceful. And so any of these eight and using all eight will show you that you can see a country will improve, a community will improve in the peacefulness. This is what our work is showing. And that's why we're trying to say, people, if you use these eight pillars when you're having an issue or conflict or problem in your community or country, try to use these eight pillars and you will see it will have a, a way to find a solution. You will find some ways and to take action as to how you can deal with your issues, whether it's the climate, whether it's lack of health, whether it's lack of education or, you know, poverty. Using these eight pillars will contribute to some form of peace. And this is why it gives you a roadmap. It gives you a, a, a way to, uh, a framework, a tool, a tool to apply. And it's practical. These, these eight pillars are very practical. Yes, ma'am. So we have uh, Pragya. Yes, please free, uh, ask your question. Hi. Uh, so I am just curious to know if all the uh, parameters, do they have the same weightage or are some more weighted or less weighted or equal in weightage? Um, the, uh, what IEP does is uh, each of those pillars, um, they have obviously they are they are um, they are ranked for each country. In other words, each country has a different score like on the eight pillars. So uh, they might have a high score or a low score for, for um, free flow of information. They might have a high, high score for corruption or low score. So because every country is different, of course, um, they will have on, on the eight pillars, they will have different scores. And if you look at, when you see our reports, which as I said to you, you have all our reports available online. And if you look at the Global Peace Index, the 2023, we have the last chapter, of every report that we produce, we have a chapter just on methodology, where we show you how we score each country on the pillars and also on the global peace index. It explains that we, we call it the chapter is on methodology. What is the ranking? For example, when you look at our graphs, I showed you many of our graphs of how we we show the um, the the key findings of the of the um, the global peace index. You could see from the graphs that when the number is high, IEP, when, when you have a high score, like between one to five, if the score is close to five, for us, that means least peaceful, not, not high peaceful, it's low, okay? In other words, peace has gone down. When the, when, the, when the score is low, like it goes to one or negative, that means it's high peacefulness. The country is very peaceful. So that is the way IEP calculates. Uh, we use our econometrics, you know, we do this. Now, to get those eight pillars and to get that, um, that, that score, I don't know if you know, but IEP uses some 25,000 data sets and, and attitudes and surveys um, to be able to come to that score. Our research team are spending all their time collecting, analyzing a lot of data sets because of all those indicators that you saw, you know, that we have on the left hand. That's a lot of data that they collate, come together and analyze to come to that score for each country. So this is the amount of research that is being done to get to that score, to define um, how a country's peacefulness is, is ranked. Okay, and this is our, this is if you like the strength of our work because as as you know we live in a world of um, where evidence and data is important. Everybody wants to know where's the evidence. How can you say this? How can you do this? And how can you say this? Where's the evidence? We have the evidence because we are a research organization and we have the evidence. And we are I'm showing you that by the by the presentation I gave you. This is all based on data-driven research, okay? Uh, my question was actually that are, uh, amongst the parameters, are uh, each, of, uh, each of the parameters, are they equally important? Or some are, uh, you know, some parameters are considered more important in peace uh, 
Yeah, I see what you mean. No, it's not because one is more important. We we just got the eight to uh, the eight uh, uh, pillars together. It's not because uh, one is more important because in many ways. It, it will be important depending on the country, because in some countries, like I said to you, the corruption index is very significant in so many countries. But that's because they just happen to have very, um, very uh, high score on corruption, which means high means bad corruption, not not good corruption. So a high score means that the corruption is high, which is not good. So. When you see that in many countries, as I said, India is one of the countries that has a high score on corruption compared to other countries in, in, in the world. And so you start to think, well, why is it why is corruption so, so you know, such a uh, such a big thing in India? And then free flow of information is not so high. It's quite good in India. You know, so in every country, they will have different um, uh, scores. So it's not about which score is more important it's that each country will have a different score not everyone has the same score in other words there will be corruption or maybe um acceptance of the rights of others will be a high score in another country and so it's not about um different parameters it's more about each country having different uh, weight of the scores of each of each um of each pillar but it's not looking at the individual pillar. You have to put all the pillars together and then you get a picture of the piece. It's putting all the eight scores together. It's not looking at individual because you won't know the peacefulness of a country just looking at one pillar. You, it doesn't, doesn't give you any information. Like Afghanistan, they have very high score on many of the eight because that's why they're the least peaceful country in the world because they're not doing well on all the eight, right? And that's why it's like that, you know, so. So you have to look at all eight because they're connected with each other. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, yeah. Please. I hope, uh, I hope that answers the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, I guess um, this is what you were talking in the uh, while, you know, showing the presentation that each of these pillars is like the vital organ of our bodies and every organ is important and it is yes. interconnected and every right. Func right functioning of every organ is the uh, important thing for the body to move in a healthy way. Exactly, exactly. We, we use the human body very much as an example. So people understand the, the human body, how it works. And think of peace the same way as a yeah. system. Yeah. Ma'am, I find it's a very, it's a very apt example. And it's really relatable that how every organ is important and how the functioning of even single uh, organ, if it's not functioning properly, it will yeah. make us feel uh, unhealthy and ill. So, yes. yeah. Thank you. And Zikra, we have Zikra, Poonam. Please feel free, uh, free to share your comments and questions if you have. We have Tulika, we have Sonal. Anybody, please? Everybody? Okay, so before um, anyone ask, uh, I have a question, ma'am, which is, um, so obviously uh, these terms, as you said, these are, I think, huge uh, these parameters are, I would, and the talk we are having right now about peace, which is, uh, which is the huge global demand. And as well as if we, uh, you know, refine it down, then it is also the requirement of each individual, I feel, you know, the internal peace. I, I relate, this, uh, relate this topic with us as well. Like every individual, if you are, if you are healthy, right, and then you can create a healthy environment, right? You'll be able yes. to more connect with it, you'll be able to more, uh, you know, uh, contribute to that healthy environment. But on the other hand, if you're not, you know, if you are ill, or maybe you're not uh, have a peace internally, you're not having a you, peace with yourself, then you will, won't be able to contribute in a positive way, or maybe you'll be able to contribute in a negative way, you know, you'll be able to increase the negative peace. So how as an individual, you know, what are the things which as an individual, as a student, or maybe as an uh, as a working person, how can we contribute towards, you know, the SDG goals or towards this piece? So, yeah, this is my yeah. question. Well, this is what I think we want to show that 
by being able to understand peace as a system, and then we are part, just like us, we are part of a system, that peace starts with us. As you know, you cannot work on peace, this concept of peace, what everybody talks about, whether it is, you know, um, peace in Afghanistan or peace in India or peace in my suburb, in my community here, uh, unless you start with yourself, because at the end, you have to say, am I, am I, do I understand what, what peace means for me, for me? Am I in peace? And like you said, actually, you raised a very good point. Just like I said to you, we must look at internal, external. It's not just looking at outer peace, dealing with the problems of the world and our environment and our you know, communities. We also have to look at ourselves. We cannot do any peace outside if we don't have peace inside. So for what what we are trying to understand in positive peace, if it is like a system, you also have to look at you yourself as a system. If you are going to deal with peace, you have to also look at yourself and see, do I have peace within myself too? Because how can I go and help everybody else with peace if I'm not myself inside peaceful? Okay, so Pasuba, you mentioned a very important point because you're linking peace. Again, you're looking at peace as a system. It's also internal, external. Okay, so when it looks at how we can start, let's look at ourselves first. So I must be first in peace and have peace of mind, if you like, peace within ourselves to be able then to understand how we can start doing peace outside whether it's out with our community, with our organization or whatever. And then we can start to see very clearly how we can start looking at all the issues to do with peace as a system, because it's connected to us. Okay. And this is why you, you can use the eight pillars. For example, um, in some workshops that we did, um, I use the example of COVID. Everyone has been affected by COVID and the pandemic. Now, if you use the eight pillars, how can you find ways of how, for example, how did your community uh, deal with COVID uh, when COVID happened? And give me examples of where you can use the eight pillars to show you how to, how uh, your community dealt with COVID. I'm thinking about maybe you can say, if you like, you know, your community where you live, there was COVID. And then what was happening there? And what did the community do to deal with COVID? Look at the eight pillars. For example, take free flow of information as one pillar. Was there was there good information? Was there access to information during the COVID time to improve the situation of the people? Were there some examples of what happened during COVID in your community? In, in my community in Australia, we had huge information all about vaccinations, all about messages coming out. It was radio, this, that. We had government giving messages. We had community messages coming out, out of our ears about needing to take vaccination, needing to wear masks. We had so much information. That's an example of you use free flow of information to show you how the community was able to address the COVID pandemic. I, I'm using the COVID pandemic just as an issue, just like you would use a, a conflict or a war, okay? But I'm using that to give you an example of, of when you are in a workshop, how you can use the eight pillars. So for example, if you want to use, uh, uh, you can think of an issue in, in India right now, I don't know, think of an issue and think of, um, have a discussion, if you like, with your colleagues about how we can use the eight pillars to see how we could address this issue. And that's, that's where you can start to see that you will take some action or you maybe you will do some projects or you will do some intervention that will end up contributing to peace. Yes, ma'am. That's a great, I mean, that's a great way to, you know, start the communication, interaction, and to really understand the depth of the issues. And yes. when you I were guess, saying, yeah. Yes, I'll give you an example of a workshop we did in the Philippines. Okay. It was in the South, where there's a fighting between the Muslim South 
uh, indigenous community and the government. And then also there is military, you know, rebels and also indigenous. So very mixed community and always have been fighting. There has been internal civil war there for many years. We did a workshop where we brought in representatives from the rebel group, from the Muslim uh, community, government people, and then also the indigenous community, mostly women and, and uh, farmers. We had the workshop together with all of these different community where we showed them about the, the concept of positive peace and the eight pillars. And they, this group together started to understand what these eight pillars were and how they can address their problems by using these eight pillars. The result of that workshop is that they came up with some very good ideas. They found out that the indigenous wanted to help improve their poverty because they had no, no money. So they set up small, small market garden, you know, income generating. That came out of the workshop. And that was an example of equitable distribution of resources. When you redistribute resources to give to the people less advantaged, uh, who are poorer. And this is an example of the, the uh, indigenous community improving their economic situation by setting up market gardens. The military, uh, not the military, the rebel group, the Muslim rebel group, they set up a hotline because they wanted to talk about the fact that they wanted to stop fighting because they said they had enough fighting. They didn't want any more to have stop fighting. And then they set up this, what you call telephone hotline. And the result of that telephone hotline was that many of the Muslim uh, rebel groups surrendered their weapons. They gave up their weapons because they said, we don't want to fight anymore. We are sick and tired after all these years. We want to finish this fighting and we're sick and tired. And they gave up and surrendered their weapons because they were able to communicate their frustrations and through this hotline on the phone. And then another group, the government decided to do some education uh, information uh, and to try to listen to the rebel group about what they can do to help them to have new type of work, training, education for the soldiers so that they don't have to keep fighting. So what happened is that because of that workshop, all these different communities started to set up activities that contributed to peace because they used the eight pillars as a tool. So that and do you know now that the president of Philippines invited IEP last year to come and speak to all the local governments in the country because they want to do the training on positive peace for the local department of local government and the department of interior, which is the police. Ma'am, this is, uh, this is surreal. This is, this is such, so hopeful. And yeah. this, it gives a very strong message that you know an, an individual has the capacity and yes. what i uh, got from your uh, this example is that the problem is the lack of awareness people are not aware for example yes. i think uh, this organization is doing a great job and the solution is dialogue you know that's it exactly and that's what you are you know promoting yes. Yes, it is because we, we cannot discuss this unless all the people come together and they can be able to freely express their own opinions. These are people talking together. They have never, some of them, they have not ever met each other before, but they are come together, together in peace at the end, you know, and they are working together. They're working together on taking some activities, doing things together, solving the problem together. And it is through dialogue. And the, the point about this is that they, you cannot do peace by yourself. True. You have to work with others. And that's the whole idea why you have to bring people together. So the concept of using this tool is to bring people together so they can use this tool as a collective, you know, team, team approach, team, yes. teamwork approach. And often these people, they have never sat next to each other before. Many, some of them, they are, they have been before enemies, but because they have the common goal, they all want peace. That's what brings them together. This is wonderful. And yeah. as you were giving the example of COVID, so I think COVID has clearly taught each and everyone that you cannot be safe alone until 
your society is safe you know yeah yes so exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we have many we have... many more examples in iraq we 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 did a workshop with religious leaders in in kurdistan so northern iraq we brought religious leaders together and they really like the concept of positive peace so you see you can get people from you know uh, we work with the police we work with the uh, african uh, you know pastoralists you know the the um the um the farmers the livestock uh, uh, uh people with the livestock who have no education but they 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 understood it you don't need to have high uh, knowledge it is for all of us peace is inside of us we all have ability to create peace as you know this is why we call it positive because we are we are not interested in conflict we are interested in improving the human well-being that is what we define as peace positive peace it's about improving human well-being not focus not starting with the conflict so this is where we are very different that's why when you talked about naim mentioned you talked about already the conflict straight away we don't start there you know we we have to start as wait a minute um i i i worked and i lived in afghanistan i lived in afghanistan um when it was peaceful and i have afghan friends who told me the time when it was peaceful and i have australian friends who told me they traveled to afghanistan when it was peaceful so we have in our minds we know that we can create the peace i hope you understand that it's a question of getting people together to understand that we need to have everyone together though if we want to create peace not just by ourselves basically this platform is a reminder uh, which uh, you know simply reminds us of being to just give uh, to to pause for a second and just remind ourselves that we are humans and peace is inherent right yes that's right yes ma'am uh, we also have a re- request that uh, can we uh, can you also share the slides with us um, you know so that we can uh, uh, go back to the slides again uh, whenever we want to have a look on these uh, yes you know, i will facts. i will um, i will uh, just have a look at my slides and then i will pass them on to bezad sure that would be great um i did i did give him quite a few reading materials to read which um uh which uh, um i didn't you know obviously mention in the presentation but i thought that he will send it to you because i i sent him a few links um and i think that's important that we we just look look at that area and the, uh, one of them is also uh, the just only about maybe about a week ago um the the 2023 women peace and security index came out uh which is uh, not from ip this is from the georgetown university in america and they put out the um the women peace and security index which is a very important index that is very connected to peace and also the link of peace the uh, the, the importance of gender equality contributing to the ecology of peace in other words these these are very linked uh as we know um that for us um women um are very much under um uh, represented and and are are um in many ways um um hampered or uh, restricted from participating in many of the decision making leadership negotiations with peace so this women peace and security index looks at peace as not only um about absence of conflict but also looking at the issue of inclusion as you know the the very key principle of the sustainable development goals is leave no one behind and this is a very important issue with peace we want to build inclusive societies in other words leaving no one behind and also peace is about inclusion and also about justice and with justice we talk about importance of human rights so yes, that's that's why the women peace and security index is important there's a lot of social data that often we don't get in many of the index that just look at peace or conflict they don't look at a lot of what we call social disaggregated data like 
gender, like nationality, ethnicity, age, religion, language. These are very important social data that we don't, we often do not get enough information of this social data that is so important for um, for peace. Yes, ma'am. Do we have more questions? Anyone? Any question? Comment? Any query? Madam, mind. I want to add uh, because you were uh, talking. What was the in its politics? in making peace and government in Afghanistan. Uh, how would you for international parties? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Naim, I, I didn't hear you very well. I think it was uh, breaking up the, the, um, the sound. Can you please repeat the question? Yes. Uh, what the U.S. failed in Afghanistan uh, in making uh, in in its uh, politic in making peace and government in Afghanistan, and how much would you score the international parties? Because you were in Afghanistan and you were the witness uh, on the yeah. field. Uh, uh, what do you score about the internet? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, their their role in what has happened? What has been their what? Yes. Uh, was they successful or were they failed in their politics uh, applying in Afghanistan? Um, my personal, my personal opinion. This is just my personal opinion. Um, from my experience, there is that um, we have failed. We have failed um, badly, the Afghan people, and we promised the Afghan people after the Bonn Agreement. You know, back in two thousand and two, after. Um, uh, this was the, uh, the the beginning phase after uh, the Taliban was first, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, defeated, and uh, um, we had the new new Republican government come in uh, with Karzai. This was a time I was there, so this was I was in in Afghanistan 2002 until 2007. This was a time where we had. We had promised, the international community had promised the Afghan people that we would help to rebuild the, the society. And we failed. We put so much uh, money. We don't know what had happened. But at the end, um, I could say that the international community failed the people. And uh, and I think we there was you can you can write about this you can write a book about this and many people have, um, but for me uh, I feel that what has now been recognized is that the community in Afghanistan had achieved a lot of had transformed their society in the last 20 years before the Taliban um, uh, to take over 2021, that even though there were still many problems, of course, with the government um, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan and the issues that were still there with the, you know, with the corruption, with the warlords and so forth, and many other issues, there were so much achievements in the air, in so many areas, whether it was in improvements in the law, in, improvements in political participation, improvements in education, uh, it, it, there were many, many improvements and gains that the people were able to achieve. That were now in a position. We know that the Afghans have achieved this, but unfortunately now, because of the uh, the problems with the government. Um, there is now no longer a leadership to support the people. And this is why we are in the problems that we have. It has been a failure very much of leadership in the country. And the Afghan people, I think, now deserve better because they also have experienced not only their own problems, but also they've also got the problems of climate, drought, environmental, and everything. Like last, you only know just two weeks ago, we have been supporting the earthquake that just happened in Herat. So we already know the situations. So 
it is just one of the difficulties with uh, with the situation in Afghanistan that politically um uh the country is 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 in a situation that um there is a failure of the leadership so i i hope this is this is we are not very optimistic but we have failed the international community has failed the afghan people that is definitely the case for, from my experience we promised them and we didn't fulfill if that makes sense naim i would just sure. like to uh, take the opportunity to tell our participants and uh, patricia you as well that uh, naim has been working on the ground for the uh, herat uh, earthquakes he's been doing a lot of humanitarian oh. work and uh, yeah so i just wanted to share that uh, you know Great. just uh, put in the word thank you well, that's wonderful you. where we i'm so pleased because um when we heard in Australia about the earthquake, um, and uh, Naeem, I was I was in Afghanistan when the earthquake in two thousand and two, Narin, so in Baglan. So I have experience of being there. So I that's why I'm saying to you, when we had this earthquake in Herat province, I was very upset, and we I'm working with Afghans in Australia with the diaspora, and we already sent some um, some money for food and water and clothing already now. But the thing is that um, the the news the news was they they said nothing. There was very little news in the world, you know, hardly anything. When only people like us who know we're able to do something and it's not right that you know there is so much uh, there's so, there's so much need at the moment in Afghanistan but it is being drowned by all the other issues around the world that it seems to be dominating and of course it's very almost like they have forgotten Afghanistan you know so we are keeping to we are keeping to make a lot of noise about Afghanistan because we will not stop <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are really great, grateful for uh, the people of um, Australia because uh, there is an organization by the name of Australian Relief Organization. They are uh, keep helping for uh, earthquake vulnerables of Herat. Uh, they uh, send uh, some funds for uh, warm clothes and blankets for the people who are affected by the earthquake. And we are underground and distributed to this. We are very thankful for the uh, people of Australia. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Daim. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased that, uh, you know, you are doing the work there. That's great. Keep up the great work. I, I wish you. I can, sure. uh, I wish I could go back to Afghanistan. <laughs> huh. I, I miss Afghanistan you. a lot. <laughs> I wish to visit you when you come here in Afghanistan. <laughs> yes. Whereabouts are you, Naim? Whereabouts are you now? Uh, pardon, please. Can you? Where repeat? are you? Where are you now? Yeah. I'm in Kabul right now. Okay. Good. Good. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I guess we had a very fruitful session, and uh, first of all, uh, I would uh, like to say that nine. We are so proud, and you know, people like you, you know, make us remind our duties and you know that in even in the, the the force of an individual can you know bring a real change so thank you so much for that reminder and uh, thank you so much patricia ma'am for a great great session i mean i am having a lot of uh, take backs and i'm sure you all must be having the same and let's really hope because i always have a, 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 a you know strong feeling that together we can bring and together we can you know bring change and uh, and it starts with us it definitely starts with us so yes until the next time have a great time everyone thank you so much ma'am thank you so much every participant have a great time ahead and please take care thank you okay bye bye